Without further ado, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Nadia Lopez. Uh, in 2015, uh, she was a principal and founder of Mott Hall Bridges Academy, um, a school in one of America's poorest communities. And she rose to fame when the blog Humans of New York featured an eighth grader from her school who, when asked who influenced you the most in life, responded with my principal. Uh, the post became a huge hit, received over one million likes on Facebook. Um, and really thrust Dr. Lopez and her school into the spotlight. Um, and she's gonna be talking to us today about her book, The Bridge to Brilliance, um, which really chronicles uh, educators who are trying to improve opportunities for all of America's children. So without further ado, Dr. Lopez. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Good. Um, so good afternoon. I just got back from Dubai. I was there for a week. Um, I was selected last year as one of the top 50 top educators um, in the world from an organization um, called the Varkey Foundation. They host what's called the Global Teacher Prize. And so they convene all of us together um, in the beautiful city of Dubai um, to be in a think tank to improve education, to talk about what are some of the challenges. And while I was there yesterday, I was invited by Dr. Abdullah, who is in charge um, of an organization known as um, the Knowledge and Human Development Authority. And pretty much what they do is kind of like the Chancellor of New York. They evaluate and support schools that are located inside of Dubai. Immediately when I walk in, and the reason why I'm starting this is to build up um, to what my presentation or my conversation really is about, is that you walk in and it's like when I walked into Google the first time, right? This space where people are happy to be at work and it's unconventional. It's not like what you've been taught when you were in school that everything will be a desk and chairs and everyone will be to themselves. It's actually a space where people convene and the culture is we are here to work together collaboratively. We are here to solve world problems. We are here to make life better and we are here to enjoy it. So yesterday was International Happiness Day. I don't know if you are aware of that, but it was. Um, and so they, were, they had a whole bunch of balloons and the guy who's on the bike, he's actually um, the greeter and he goes around and he gives people envelopes filled with happiness notes. You can walk in, you write a happy note to someone and he goes around and he just distributes it to anyone who's in this space. I happen to get a load of balloons and stand in this space as well and celebrate with them. Um, and I will say this, like, I just imagine what it would like for kids to walk into a space and have balloons that are presented to tell them that they are indeed honored and to be happy. And then there's a space that you can recalibrate your mind and center your soul. And they actually told me that they got this idea because someone came to visit Google. And when they walked in, they said, this is what education should feel and look like. So my conversation is about my book, The Bridge to Brilliance. But I'm really going to take you through the context of what it is to be in a community like Brownsville and why I created a space in which I want children to really be happy so that they can really strive for success. So just to give you a little bit of background context about Brownsville, Brooklyn, oh, Mott Hopper's Academy, we have 203 scholars, that's sixth to eighth grade, 97% of them are black and Latino, 87% have free or reduced lunch. 30% have been identified and diagnosed with some type of special need, so they have an individualized education plan. But if I could put it on paper and evaluate all of my scholars, I would tell you it would be more al along the lines of 65% who have special needs. 88% of our scholars come in with a kindergarten to third grade reading or math capability level. In the seven years that I've been open, We've lost $600,000. We've lost a little bit more, but rounding it out, $600,000 in terms of our allocation. And that's really because we have to compete with charter schools. So let me be very clear. I'm not against charter schools. I'm all about providing children with opportunities and the ability to have the best education possible. 
What I am against is when we start to target schools and talk about what we're not doing in terms of empowering children as opposed to coming together collaboratively to improve instruction, to share resources. And let me be clear on that as well. If my budget is $2 million and my salaries for teachers is $1.5 to $1.8 million, I'm only left with maybe $300,000 for anything else to run the school. Charter school may have a budget of $6 million. They get the same $2 million that I would get to run the school, but they're actually able to fundraise. And people who are on their board can fundraise money, get them grants. I don't have that luxury. So when we talk about equity in education and we talk about what public school is not doing, we need to have an authentic conversation about what's lacking in terms of the support, the access, and the opportunities. 61% of my teachers have zero to five years teaching experience, and 39% who have more than that have worked at failing schools. I put that in there because it's very important that you understand. My teachers who come to me that are new teachers who have zero to five years don't have teaching experience anywhere else. So what my teachers don't understand is that we're really the country club of education. My school, the space, how it's created, is not the challenging space of when I came up as a, school, as a um, teacher. My teachers don't know what it's like to be in a space where an administrator demeans and demoralizes you. My teachers don't know a space where teachers are allowed to disrespect children and children are allowed to disrespect teachers. My teachers do not know what it's like not to have supplies because I don't take any additional money past what I make and I do not pay any other administrators additional money past what they make on a yearly salary to make sure that we have everything that we need. So I work 7.30 till 8, 9, 10 o'clock at night. My hours are 7.30 to 3.30. Technically, I'm entitled to overtime, but this is my work. And I feel that because I service children, because this is my life's calling, I'm not gonna take a dime extra. My teachers, however, because they work for a union, they are entitled to make $45.66 extra after they've worked six hours and 20 minutes. So if I ask my teachers to stay after school to do any additional work, if they um, host any type of clubs, if they run any teams, they are entitled to make $45.66. That's additional money that comes out of our budget. <laughs> the 39% of the teachers who came from failing schools, they understand it. They get it. They know that they're in a country club and they appreciate the space. But they're also in a place of they want more. They want the opportunities for leadership. And when you're in a small school, you often have to worry about, it takes one person to do three or four jobs. So I have to manage the space in which I don't want my teachers to feel burnt out. I want them to know that they're in a space that we love and care about them just as we love and care about our staff, as we care about the kids. But I want them to be able to thrive as well. So Brownsville, Brooklyn. It's about one mile square radius. We have 80,000 residents. Only 32% of our residents have a high school diploma. Only 14% have a bachelor's degree, and only 3% have a master's. We have the highest crime rate in all of New York City. We have the um, lowest parental involvement. So out of the 203 kids that I have that attend my school, I am lucky if I could get five parents in for a parent-teachers meeting. Not a principal's meeting, but our PTA meetings, we only get five parents. In order to do anything in the school, we need seven parents for a quorum. In order to make any changes, we need seven parents for a quorum on our PTA. We only get five parents. So unfortunately, my PTA can't get as much as they would like done. So they have to trust that I, as the principal, will do what's in the best interest of their children. The average income is $11,000 in the housing developments. So those projects, we have the most projects in all of the United States. 
$11,000. On the outskirts, though, which are the small residential homes, it's $28,000. They say to live in New York City at minimum, you need $45,000. How many of you could live off of $11,000? Maybe for summer youth when you were 15 or 14, but not as an adult. And many of our residents, our children included, have never ventured beyond their community. I also want to press upon you this. We have the highest health risk in all of New York City. HIV and AIDS is the highest in Brownsville. The average age range, 11 to 21. I'm going to say it again. 11 to 21. Highest in cholesterol, highest in heart disease, highest in asthma, highest in cancer. So on top of not having healthy living, healthy nutrition, on top of all of these other things, you think to yourself, wow, this is in Brooklyn, New York. How many of you have been to Brooklyn? OK. Downtown Brooklyn, where now it's now, downtown Brooklyn is known as Dubro or something like that. I don't even know. Like, I'm so against it, right? Because I'm Brooklyn all day, and I'm like, it's downtown Brooklyn. <laughs> but you think about it. Here's all of these great erected buildings with glass and Century 21, Target. It's phenomenal. You go to Williamsburg, people are hustling and bustling. And then you go to Brownsville. And none of that is happening. You don't feel excited to be there. You're surviving. So our challenges, as I stated, highest density of housing developments in New York City. We lack safe spaces. So in the summertime, kids stay in their houses. Idle hands, idle minds become dangerous. We have a lot of shootings that happen in the summertime. Schools are competing for other children. So we have to compete with, uh, with charter schools. And smart but not so smart for us, charters now start at fifth grade for their middle school. So what that means, it undercuts us who start at sixth grade. So they start to look at public schools, take the kids from fourth grade, have them come into their schools in fifth grade. I'm looking for kids when they start sixth grade. Most of the time when I get the kids, it's because they didn't make it in the charter schools. So let me give you a little, a, a little um, inside track. October 31st is when our budgets close in New York City. Okay, So whoever's sitting in our classrooms, if I have all of you in here, October 31st, I get money for each and every one of you. If you have special needs, they give me about $10,000 per child. If my child doesn't have special needs, it's $4,500. And I'm going to give you context about the money as well in terms of the numbers. Now, charter schools, November 1st, that child who is behavior is not something we can manage. They may need services that we can't provide. The parent isn't really supportive. November 1st, that child is coming to me without any of the money that has been allocated. So I have to service this child without the money, right? But the charter schools gets to keep the money. Now, here's the other thing about it. <sighs> New York City Department of Education, we have a lot of people in a lot of offices. Those of us who are in schools, we're paying for those people who are in offices. In charter schools, the actual money that's allocated for children per state, let me give you around about maybe $12,000 per child, right? So if I have a charter school, I'm going to get $12,000 per child. Because the idea is that charter schools are supposed to get their own buildings that they're supposed to pay for. They're supposed to lease them or build them, whichever way. New York City Public School, as a principal, I only get $45,000 per child. New York State allocates $12,000. If I'm in a charter school, I get $12,000. If I'm in a New York City public school, I get 4,500. That's because as a New York City public school principal, we're actually paying for all of the other people who are working in the Department of Ed. But charter schools are co-located in our public buildings. So they don't have to pay rent. They don't have to lease anything. 
That's why they end up with more money than us, right? All they do is pay a dollar. That was under Mike Bloomberg, a dollar to use our spaces. So when you hear the arguments, no one ever has those conversations. So we're always at a disadvantage. So despite all of that, I still wanted to open a school to close a prison. Because I get it. I understand that it's systemic. I understand that those who are not in the education system have no idea. And all you hear are the people who complain, the people who tell the story, the narrative that makes them feel good to push an agenda. But at the end of the day, I'm dealing with children who survive every single day, who are not asking you to save them, but need access and opportunity. And the reason why my children aren't what they call proficient and they're not doing extremely well is because we're not dealing with the issues that they're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. The post-traumatic stress disorder that comes with poverty, that comes with the fact that when you don't have a parent in the household or you have parents in the household who are as young as 20, 18, 19, or you have five, six, seven, eight siblings in a household, that's a lot to undertake. And so we can complain about what parents should do and what we should do with this community, but I live it and I breathe it every single day. So it's about what are we going to do in terms of turning this into an opportunity for solutions. And so my belief is I want to make sure that children take over this world and become globally competitive. Because the reality is that every job is not going to be here in the United States. And they need to have opportunities of going abroad. But they need to be able to become accepting, not just tolerant, but accepting of others, be able to communicate, be able to empathize, be able to show respect, and be loving. I need to have teachers who are passionate about what they do and not there just because they're trying to figure out what they're going to do. That's part of opening up a school, because there are a lot of people who say, I want to teach. Any of you tried teaching before? Yeah. Great to be at Google, right? <laughs> it's hard. Yes? It's hard. <laughs> so it feels good. It feels like this is a great opportunity to do something to help someone else. But you're not learning that in school. You're not learning the real context of there are some real issues you have to deal with before you can even get to the content. And how do you deal with that? How do you deal with poverty? How do you deal with children who can't read on grade level? How do you deal with not having enough supplies? How do you deal with that administrator who could care less about what you're doing and doesn't support you? How do you deal with crazy? There should be a class, crazy 101, <laughs> public education. But it doesn't exist. Right? I also needed to make sure that parents are aware of what's going on in Mount Hall Bridges Academy and trust the process. I told you I get five parents in, but I bet you this, all 203 kids, their parents trust me. <coughs> they won't show up. A lot of them just trust me. They'll show up for graduation. They'll give me a hug. The entire family will be there, and they'll say to me, Ms. Lopez, we love you, we thank you, and all these great things. And I always try to remind them, like, it doesn't stop here. I fought for your child even when you weren't present. But your child is going to enter high school where they're going to have to just defend themselves. And we tried our best to su support them, to help them navigate, to advocate for themselves. You can't trust the system. So I thank them all the time. They're giving me their most precious gifts which is their child. But they shouldn't trust everyone with that. I have a 15-year-old daughter. People see me coming in her school building. It's like, oh, God, Jesus. Hi, Ms. Lopez. Everything OK? <laughs> nope, I need to see such and such teacher. Let me tell you, the first thing they'll say is, um, you can take the elevator upstairs. No one will escort me. It's just like we don't even want to be part of the conversation. Because they get it. I'm not, I don't show up unless there's a real issue. I'm my daughter's advocate. I understand the importance of education. And I get that from my parents, who are immigrants. So a little background about me. My mother's from Guatemala. My father's from Honduras. They do not have a formal education in terms of they didn't go to high school. They didn't get a college degree. All they did was come here with the belief that opportunity exists. 
They met at a party in the Bronx. My mom played hard to get. My dad was not going to accept no. Six months later, they got married, and they had me. My mom had five miscarriages before she gave birth to me, so I'm her miracle baby because I was a preemie. So when it came to education, my mother found whatever school that was going to nurture me, but she also understood that it didn't exist in our immediate district. The best school was literally three blocks away, but it was in another district, so my mom had to ask a neighbor to write her a lease just so I could go to that school. Had my mom not done that, I don't know if I would be standing here today doing the things that I'm doing. It was the teachers that she trusted. It was the space that she created. It was the opportunities that they provided for me that allows me to know what is possible. Because I lived during the crack era. I lived during the times that there were gangs running rampant in New York City. And despite that, my parents felt like we made it through poverty in Guatemala, Honduras. You're going to get on the train. You're going to figure it out. Mind your business. Don't talk to anybody. Call us when you get home. We didn't have cell phones. You better be in the house at 3.30 when we call you. Right? When that phone rings, pick up the phone. And that's what I learned. But it was also during middle school that my parents separated that I found the saving grace of a school building with adults who cared enough about me, who let me stay there until 9 o'clock at night. So when I talk about staying in my school building, I've been doing it since I was 11. And when I've created a school where children can stay until 6, 7 o'clock at night, even 10 if they want to, it's because I understand that by creating that space, I'm making sure that a young lady is not going to get pregnant, that a young man is not going to end up getting shot. He's not going to be recruited by gangs. That's my reality every single day. So off of my experiences, I've created a space that I wanted to believe that children would be happy, that they understood that they were honored. And so one, it starts with my team. A great leader understands that it can't be done by themselves. I mean, I could do it by myself, because I couldn't. However, I need to have a team. So I get to choose my teachers. I want to be very clear on saying this. I always say want to be clear because it's also going online. Everyone is not made for every single space. So those of you who tried out teaching and figured, uh, this isn't really for me, I'm that person that helps you understand this really isn't for you. Let's figure out what you're really good at. The reason why I do that is because I actually sat in spaces with adults, principals who would take the time to assassinate the character of teachers and go after their license. I don't think that's fair. You might do better on the Upper West Side. You may do better with high school. You may do better with elementary school. Middle school is a beast. Children are very sassy. <laughs> they can be very defiant. They have little personalities, but they're trying to figure themselves out. It takes a special type of person who can love them through all of that. And a lot of patience. OK? So I'm that person who will help you identify, is this the profession for you? Or maybe we need to get to another grade level. But I also want my teachers to develop a sense of trust, because we are a team. So I used a good analogy with my team maybe three weeks ago where we talked about the Super Bowl. Any of you watch the Super Bowl? Some of you? OK, so you know that the Patriots won, right? Everybody knows that? <laughs> OK. And Atlanta was actually ahead. Yes. And the biggest upset was that the Patriots won. But I wanted my teachers to understand something happened in that game. Because by all sense of accounts, Atlanta should have won by the numbers. But something happened as an a turn of events on the field. So we watched the video, it was about six minutes off of YouTube, where they watched from the beginning to the end. So even my Spanish teacher who's in the corner who doesn't understand American football, right? <laughs> she understood the gist. You got to get the ball on the other side and there's points, right? That's how we described it to her. She understood. And so part of the understanding was that great teams, even when you feel like you're failing, 
you still push through. You don't give up. You don't let the other person see you sweat, but you also have studied your opponent. So you have to study the kids. Even when they're failing and you feel like you're failing, you have to find that there's something, some good potential that's within that room that's going to give you a winning moment. Atlanta, on the other hand, got really excited by the, what they thought was going to be their win. They stopped paying attention to the game. They got too comfortable. At the end of the day, when you have a Tom Brady on your team, if it's not the last three seconds and you're on the other side of the end zone, you don't celebrate. Ultimately, a lot of teachers get happy and keep their eye off of the ball. And when things don't go their way, they don't know how to transition. When they're faced with kids who can't read on grade level, they can't figure it out. They haven't studied their craft. They haven't mastered the strategies. They haven't asked for help. They become isolated. Then what they become is very defensive. And then ultimately, they give up. I don't want anyone to ever feel that way, not in our space. The next thing we do is we do a lot of branding at the school. We use a lot of positive words. So in this particular case, Occupy Schools became part of our movement. Every single one of our scholars gets a t-shirt every single year because we do it during December because oftentimes when they go on break, they're not going to get anything for a Christmas vacation, their Christmas gifts, or whatever they celebrate. I want them to know that this is going to add on to their uniforms. I want them to be reminded how much I love them, and I can't wait to see them come back in their new shirts. And it also takes the burden off of some of their parents who can't afford to purchase additional uniform tops. So Occupy Schools reminds our parents, our staff, our scholars, the importance of being in our school spaces. If you're not there, if you do not show up, you don't learn. If our parents don't, if our teachers don't come to school on time, they don't show up, it's like miss a minute, miss a day, our kids are going to miss a lot. If our parents never show up, even if it's to just contact me, you'll never know what's going on. I also call my scholars Brownsville Brilliance. Can anybody tell me how a diamond is created? Pressure, right? A lot of pressure. I want my kids to be reminded there's a lot of external pressure. The pressure of people who are not going to believe in you. The pressure of the gangs, the pressure of drugs, the pressure of the prostitution, the pressure of the health risk, the pressure of just breathing some days. But with all of that, you're exceptional. You're resilient. And you are Brownsville's brilliance. No one can ever deny that or take that away from you. So don't see Brownsville as this place that's negative. See it as a place that you're a survivor, and not too many people can do that. The next time someone tries to speak badly about where you come from, tell them, come meet you there. I bet you they won't show up, <laughs> right? Turn the negative into something positive. I always tell them, my value is because of Brownsville. If I worked in Park Slope, no disrespect to Park Slope, no one ever comes up to the Park Slope teacher and says, oh my god, wow. You work in Park Slope? How do you do it? They don't say that. I say I work in Brownsville. It's like, oh my god, how do you do it? God bless you. God should have blessed me in either space, right? But it's seen as that's not what I could do. So thank you for doing it, which is kind of good because then I guilt people into helping me. <laughs> so you won't come to teach, but can you come to the school to talk to the kids for two hours, though? Can we do that? Or can they come visit your space so that they can see what their opportunities are? And people will say yes quicker to that than me saying, can you come teach for a week? Uh, a week? What? Right? We also celebrate college week at our school. So. Many of our kids are never going to understand how amazing it is to go away to college. 
They're never going to have those conversations sitting at the kitchen table. They're never going to know what it's like to go to alumni weekend. They're never going to know what it's like to join a sorority or fraternity or have those conversations that usually are had when your parents' friends come over or your parent has that hat or they're having a great conversation about what it was like to go to school. So we have to do it for our kids. There was once a conversation with a realtor who came to the school and said, how, do we, how is it possible that we could create all these great schools in New York City and then we give these kids everything that they could possibly want and then they get to college and then they drop out? And I asked him, I said, have you ever asked a kid who dropped out why they dropped out? Of course, he was silent. I said, it's called culture shock. Here's the thing what people don't tell us whose parents have never gone to college. Hey, you got to pay for books. If I've gone to public school, my books have been given to me every single year. Now I have to pay like $150 for a book that if I got someone's book last year has now changed, so the pages are different, so I can't even follow, so I really got to get the book. Has anybody told me that by the time we get to November and it's midterms that I'm going to be eating cold pizza and coffee and soda to get it through? However, if I've lived under public assistance, we don't have, like, there's a different way of surviving, and we don't drink that. We have, like, family opportunities where we're eating different types of food. Do you ever think about that? Have you ever thought that you're taking a child away from a space where they feel included to get to another space where they feel excluded and no one ever prepares them for that? And he looked at me and said, no. Yeah, that's why oftentimes kids drop out, but then money runs out. Or the education that they received in high school was not on par with what they needed to get through college. And so you take remedial classes in college and the money runs out and you can't continue on. I said, there's so many factors. Kids don't just want to drop out. It's not what they do waking up. I just want to drop out today. So he realized that there had to be a different way of college and career readiness. And so when I started my school, it was about, we need to make sure that kids know that teachers actually went to college. Because we never talk about where we went to school. They go to the doctor's office. Doctor wants you to know that they went to John Hopkins. They went to Columbia. They put it up. Hello. And it's big, right? If you ever went to your doctor's office, especially pediatrician, they're making sure you know where they went. Same thing as a lawyer. It's like a badge of honor to say which school you went to. You go into a teacher space, there's nothing that says we went to college. We went to college. Put your degrees up. Dust them off. Bring them in. Take pictures. If you're in a sorority fraternity, put them on your wall. And let's have conversations around that. And then wear your paraphernalia. And just like boast for the day. Like, yeah, I went to the school. What? 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 You want to come? You want to come? Right? And the kids are like, oh, I want to go to that school. And how do I get a t-shirt like that? And that also prepares them for when we go to places like Harvard, or we go to Yale, or we go to Columbia, or we go to City College, or we go to Vassar, that they're having those experiences. And now they know what to ask, because we start preparing them from sixth grade. Financial aid. <coughs> are there support groups there? What's the ratio teacher to student? We want them to be able to understand the language, again, to navigate. Building literacy skills. So we recognize that kids like to be on their iPads and all this other great stuff. So how do we make sure that we start to create an opportunity where they can use technology and still read? Because our kids don't have the opportunity of often going to the libraries because the libraries are embedded within the projects and the projects are segregated by gangs. And no one dared to think about that, especially our boys. There are literally streets they cannot cross because they may stand being killed. We use Google Hangout sessions so that they can communicate with people around the world or even locally at their offices. So we try to use technology where kids understand that it's just not for Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat, where they're just doing all of their craziness. <laughs> but how can we engage in good conversation? Hey, you can still dance while you're on a Google Hangout, but let's do it for something positive and engaging. 
My teachers lead professional development. They're the experts. Share what you know. Take the opportunity to give to your colleagues. Develop a collaborative community within yourselves. Now, because of the money that we raise from Humans of New York, we split the money three ways. Our scholars, in addition to our legacy group, I had to create a legacy group because my graduates were like, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> we graduated before this money came in. We want to go to college too. Sure, we continue on the legacy of them going to college. So I literally take them on college tours and trips during February and April when we're supposed to be on spring break and midwinter break. And then they come in um, twice, once a month for check-ins, but they're usually there once a week just to come into the building to have a place to study and hang out. But we do the college trips. We also do a summer, summer steam because the kids are so far behind. We want to make sure that they're actively working and learning. So for five weeks, 8.30 to 3 o'clock, Monday through Friday, the, scholar, the scholars are in classes. They're not your typical boring classes, and not to say that my teachers teach boring classes, but the reality is that they're high stake exams that they always have to get prepared for that deprives them of what really teaching is about and learning is about, right? So we try to create a balance, but summertime, it's the most amazing classes that you could imagine. So our sixth graders last year learned horticulture in urban settings, right? Because I explained to you, highest risks of health issues, so they need to understand the importance of why we have a community garden. They need to understand why you have to have healthy um, eating habits and how that needs to turn key to their family members and their community at large. So they actually present their information. They actually plant in the garden, right? Our seventh graders learn social justice through the analysis of Black Lives Matter, not just Black Lives Matter 2016, 2017, but since slavery up until now, what has gone on? Why does history continue to repeat itself? And how do you engage in understanding to protest, but making sure your protest is in a way that is nonviolent, that is cohesive, that people can understand what your ask is going to be? And how do you galvanize everyone around you to support what you're saying? So we had partnered with the US Attorney's Office. Our scholars got to see and speak to judges, look at trials, and then do a presentation and create their own magazine about some of the issues that's happening in their community as their way as um, demonstrating social justice. Our eighth graders get prepared for the high school um, exam as well as regents. So my eighth graders have the opportunity of taking the math regents because I need them to be ahead by the time they get into high school so that instead of taking algebra, they can take geometry because a lot of them are behind because they're overaged. Our scholars lead discussions, which is important. They need to understand how to present themselves. They need to have real working skills in terms of this is what we do when we are in real life. You get up and you talk and you share. Expanding horizons, we have a lot of partnerships with amazing individuals. So this is actually Brandon Stanton, Humans of New York's wife, Erin. Um, she has, a, if you go on Instagram or Facebook, it's called Susie Dog. She rescues a lot of overage animals or animals who are going to be euthanized and try to get them homes. So she's really into veterinarian science and teaching children to love and ways of being humane to animals. She runs a program out of our school. Our kids get to go to the canine unit. They've gone to an overnight disability farm. So they actually stayed upstate New York to look at animals who are disabled. Talk about being empathetic, not only to people, children who have special needs in your building, but look at what happens to animals as well. So they get to see that, and now you have so many of my kids who want to become veterinarian scientists. Because of it, I now have networking opportunities and partnering with St. George's University that's in Grenada, which allows my kids one day to go to that school to study veterinarian science, right? And those kids who are from Grenada, whose parents are from Grenada, they would have guaranteed seats in terms of they don't have to pay the high cost. They see it as an investment, creating a pipeline. 
and understanding that education is beyond the reach of just one immediate community. Digital day, I love this day. So we shut down the day of the school and we bring in people from all type of digital tech spaces because there's too many buzzwords that go around tech, digital tech, digital. I'm a principal. I would love to know what everybody in this room does, but I don't know what you do, right? So I need you to come and tell my kids what you do so that they can say, maybe I can do that too. They only become what they see. Teachers, doctor, lawyers. Maybe they want to be a police officer. But they don't subscribe to say, I want to be in tech spaces. I want to work for Google. Outside of just Google me, know that there's somebody behind that. There are people who are working in amazing spaces that you need to be in. We have guest speakers, people who come in, like I told you. Everyone that you see are my friends, or I found them on Twitter and I was like, hey, I've been following you. Can you come to the school? Great thing about social media. We have mentorship and career exploration. So New York Times would never write a positive article about Brownsville. I was getting so tired of doing Google Brownsville, and this is what would come up, and everything negative. And I said, the only way you can combat something negative is by creating your own narrative. So my friend, Sarita Gates, who has done a lot of amazing work with a lot of publications, helped my scholars to develop their own magazine. So she mentored them. She explained to them the difference facets of what makes a, a, a magazine. And then we created an online magazine called The Score. 68 pages, brilliant. Pictures, it was beautiful. You can actually go online, you can Google it, and it'll come up. Created by scholars about their community in a positive light. And because of this, when the New York Times um, writer came to our school, she saw it, and she saw alongside an article that was written by one of her counterparts. And she says, why do you have a magazine? I said, because you keep writing the wrong things. So if I don't see it, I have to create it. She took it back to her editor in chief. And as a result, they did a feature on our school, December 15, 2014, before Humans of New York. It was the first time they had ever published something positive about a community collectively. We do our Young Men Empowerment Summits. We do it for young women as well, but it's something powerful about our young men of color, knowing that they matter each and every day. So we have a mantra for them to say because the media does not remind them that they matter. We did this before Black Lives Matter. We did this before the, um, President Obama had, uh, what was it, My Brother's Keeper. We used to have that in our school, and it was not successful. The minute we changed it, and we wanted our boys to affirm to themselves that they have value in this world, that people will be willing to invest in them and come and speak to them, we ended up with 250 to 300 young men. It's part of a cohort. They go through five distinct classes per year. <coughs> 21st century college um, career readiness. They learn coding. They learn web design. They learn music production. My scholars have culinary art classes. They have photography. They also have lab rats where they get to dissect animals. They have chess. I told you I lose a lot of money, but I make a lot of good friends. If I don't know anything else, having relationships are the, is like capital. Your network becomes your net worth. 98% graduation rate for a community where children have been known to see their family members not make it through high school. And here we are building a legacy. So these are my graduates, some of them. We were at Columbia University. Um, these are the proud moments. These are the reasons why you create a space in which children are happy. The one great thing about visiting your spaces is that I get inspired to see people happy to be at work, to have choices and opportunity. I want my kids to see that despite what they see every single day in Brownsville, that tells them what they can't do. I want them to know that they can and will take over this world. I want them to also know that when they receive, they have to give back, because the only way to transform your community is not by getting and then leaving, but you actually have to come back 
and set your own legacy to impact the next generation. I am blessed. I started off by explaining to you that I was in Dubai and also the fact that I was able to be in a space that has been impacted what someone saw here in Google. But it's because of the brilliance of my scholars. It's because of the success that we're able to achieve. It's because we created a space that allows them to be happy, right? That they're actually able to live this amazing life while they're in my building. So I know I've spoken a lot, and I don't want to end without people going to the mic, but I'm going to close it out. If you have any questions, you can definitely go to the mics now. I don't want people to be like shy and say, no, I don't have anything. And then as I'm leaving, people are going to be like, so what you said was so amazing? <laughs> so I just wanted to ask you, because that's what happens all the time. Someone in this room probably needs to hear that question or would ask me the same question, so don't be afraid to come to the mic. But no, you've inspired me, and I thank you for that. So I'm going to take you on this side, and then you on that side. Yes. So I live in Brooklyn. Yes. Actually, in Fort Greene, Warm Hell, like the gen very you know quickly gentrifying neighborhood mm -hmm. where houses are millions of dollars now. Yes. Um, the, and the school that's my neighborhood school is a, a school where the principal has berated the teachers, and so now I. I would love to be the person that helps to turn around that school, but that is such a daunting task. And so now I feel, and I feel super guilty about it, but now I've opted out. And I would love to hear, like, what can we do? You know, what can I do? And what is possible to do within this really ridiculously complicated and totally unequal system of resources and people? And where can we get more people like you to take <laughs> the place of principals that berate teachers? And, administration that doesn't feel like they want to engage. So ironically enough, my teaching um, experience started in Fort Greene. And that's why I know that that's a place where people have been allowed to demean children. So it starts with leadership, right? Leadership sets the tone and it was the leader. And then there were just people who I feel like were the little cronies who felt like the only way we can survive is to be the same way. And it was so toxic. So I'm going to tell you that after three years, I had to leave. Like, I wanted to leave the first year, <laughs> but it was before they made changes that allowed us to leave. Like, we literally were held captive, and it required the chancellor to let you leave the school. As a parent, as a community, um, as a person who lives in the community, you can share your concerns with the superintendent. You can share your concerns by calling 311. Um, part of it is if they don't know what's going on, nothing will ever change. I feel like as a principal, I hold myself to the highest regards. Sometimes it's to a detriment because if a, if, if a paper didn't go home on Monday and it ends up on Tuesday, parents are like, we didn't get the paper. We didn't get the paper. And I'm like, it's a paper, right? But in other schools, if it's something like, Kids feel like they've been demoralized, they've been shut out of classes, they've been thrown out of classes, they don't speak up. And it's often because of the retaliation that they feel like it's gonna come, right? But you on the outside can speak to that. There's always someone willing to listen. It has to start with actually telling and making that call. So the options are 311, superintendent, um, those are your best options because anything else is not going to make a change. You're not going to go into the school. The principal's not going to listen to you. It's not going to make. But those people hold them accountable. Can I do one follow up? Yes. What if it's been published in the, in the Daily News and still nothing has happened? So you continue to follow up, right? It's it, it comes down to. It could be in the Daily News, but the Daily News just sometimes it just falls on deaf ears. You have to be relentless. If you're not relentless, like there's so many things that happen in our just society, right? It gets published and nothing changes until people get up and start saying this is unacceptable or going to the community board meetings and saying this is unacceptable or getting a group of parents and creating a petition and saying this is unacceptable, right? You have to continue to be that person who's going to advocate. It doesn't require 100 people to do it, but if two or three people consistently do it, someone is going to have to say there are people watching and we need to pay attention to what's going on. 
my question is with all of these statistics that you laid out for Brownsville, how do you justify or explain uh, teachers who have little to no experience coming into these communities where 60 some odd percent have either learning challenges that a teacher with little to no experience would have been exposed to, let alone the cultural differences and just all of those challenges that go into it. From my point of view, I feel like you need experience uh -huh. and sort of to be wet behind the ears before you can identify that maybe that children is being abused in some way or you see some sort of um, sort of mental or learning challenge and mm -hmm. some of that no matter how much school experience you get you only get that from experience so a couple of things <coughs> veteran teachers are expensive so I would love to have a gang load of veteran teachers but what they what they make their average would eat up your but my budget so when I'm a smaller school when I start to when I'm in a position that I have to rationalize or ration off the money, I sit and I say, how much money do I have? One veteran teacher could be the cost of two teachers because that's how much they stand to make. A veteran teacher, for some of them, is 75000 For others, it's 125000 right? They range. So I can't afford to have as many veteran teachers in the building. That's one. Second thing that becomes an issue is people don't want to work in those areas because it's a challenge. It requires a lot of energy. If you are a parent yourself and you have a child, your thought process is, can I sacrifice the time and energy that's required to do this that's going to take away from my child, right? And that, that's something people have to ask for themselves. Um, the other thing is you have a lot of teaching programs that are targeted to giving us what's considered the best and brightest to go into these spaces, but what they're learning in the schools that's supposed to be preparing them has nothing to do with what they're going to face in the schools that they're going to, right? So I have taken on the daunting task of bringing in those teaching prep programs and having those candidates come and train at my school because I really need them to understand what's going to happen when they walk in. And I'm always in the classrooms, always supporting, but I know what it's like because I was a teaching fellow. My first year, I was not prepared. My first year, the first three months, I cried every day like, I want to go back to corporate. Why did I do this? Even though I'm from Brooklyn, even though I was born and raised around folks who were poor, we were struggling. However, being in a classroom, different dynamic. What sustained me was my faith, what sustained me was that I knew someone had done it for me and I had a child, so I was going to figure it out. And what I saw was an injustice. Everyone is not built that way. So part of it is no one is asking the principals what's the challenge. They keep giving us whatever they give us. People who keep showing up are the ones who aren't the veteran teachers. And so we're kind of like called to task to make things work in a short amount of time because when you think about it, kids are only in school for 30 weeks out of the year. So it's systemic. It's not gonna be fixed overnight. Um, but because of people like me who are in the system who are like, oh, this person, we gotta fix this, we gotta work with them. It helps, but there's not enough of me. There are really great principals who are trying to do it, but there's not enough because at, at the end of the day, it's like, you have so much on your plate that you're trying to get through that that just doesn't become a fight that you have anymore. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, hey, I just had a quick question. You mentioned sure. you kept your school open till 9 or 10 o'clock at night sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, like, my kids after school, they do the basketball. They got lots of dads to coach that. I ran a computer club for my kids, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. What do your kids do at the school for, I'm, I'm guessing, like five hours afterwards? They're getting um, tutorial services. They're doing um, culinary arts. They're doing basketball. They're doing softball, track, do, uh, double dutch, step, um, clothing design. We have a program. So it's not them just hanging out. It's an actually structured program. 
um, through uh, Sonic, where, which is what the um, mayor put part of his initiative for at-risk middle schools, we have funding in place that they pay them directly to have these programs. But if I didn't have that, there's also a beacon program that stays until 9 o'clock at night. So, so it's kind of like hired um, program, or is it like parent volunteers mostly? It's hired program. We don't have parent volunteers. And oftentimes it, it goes back to parents' limitations, parents being comfortable, having something to contribute on that level. That's often the times. But if a parent has something that they can contribute, by all means, we ha accept them. But the reality is that we don't have that in our built-in. No, that's fantastic. You can do it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? but just to leave us with what can we do? What can we all do from Google to help? Um, so that's always a great question. Couple of things is I always open my doors and say, my kids need to see you. They need to be able to see individuals like yourself and what you're doing so that they can see what their possibilities are. That's one. Two, there's oftentimes I have no idea what Google can offer, right? It's the superficial things that I see. I see we can Google things. I see Google Hangouts. I see Google Docs. I understand Scratch. But there are other things that Google can offer that I have no idea exists. Um, so part of it is educate me on what that is. Um, my overall goal is to one day, in a way, um, I want to create, thinking about creating more schools and environments like this is to have those Google type schools where it's about true collaboration, setting up a space that's not doesn't have as many constraints as I have um, because of the co-sharing and really getting people to understand if you partner with organizations like a Google and Google is really willing to take that on and saying we really want to be invested in education, let's create the spaces that we do for the adults. But it makes no sense for you to do it for the adults if you're not doing it for the children who need to grow up to become those adults to appreciate the space. That makes sense? OK. So this was wonderful. I truly appreciate your time. I know some of you had lunch or you have projects you need to work on. Um, my story, the full out story of how I opened up the school and a lot of the things that I went through personally um, to get it to open, um, and it wasn't easy. It's kind of like the schools that I was in before was dangerous minds means lean on me, <laughs> literally. However, had I not gone through those experiences, I would not be as relentless about creating a space where children are safe, happy, learn to be not just tolerant, because we can tolerate a lot, but have to be accepting of every single individual because that's what humanity is about. And so if I could do it in Brownsville, Brooklyn, under the circumstances that I laid out, it can be done anywhere in this world. Trust and believe that. So the story's in the back for sale, yes. Um, if anybody purchases it, I'll be more than happy to sign it. But again, I thank you, and thank you for this forum here at Google. Appreciate it.